In this video, we're going to build on what we've already learned about the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model of a nation's economy. So we're moving now on to the government policy section of the course in which we study different tools that governments and other policymakers have at their disposal in order to achieve certain macroeconomic objectives. The first toolkit that we're going to explore is called fiscal policy. We're going to start by defining fiscal policy and then talking about what's called expansionary fiscal policy. We'll talk about the situations in which a government would want to use fiscal fiscal policy, and we'll distinguish between the effects of two different types of fiscal policy on the level of aggregate output and prices in a nation's economy. We'll start with the definition of fiscal policy. Fiscal policy has to do with the government's use of taxation and government spending as a tool for influencing the level of aggregate demand and national output in the country's economy. There are essentially two tools in the toolkit of fiscal policy. That is taxation, I'll call that T for taxation or taxes, and government spending, which is G for government spending. Policymakers can influence the level of spending on public goods, on infrastructure, on education, healthcare, defense, on transfer payments, on all sorts of other things that put money in the pockets of the nation's households or contribute to the nation's supply of capital goods or infrastructure goods. Taxation, of course, this is where the money comes from. Every dollar that the government spends, it ultimately has to get from somewhere, either through taxes or through borrowing it from somebody else. So taxation and government spending together make up the two tools in the toolkit of fiscal policy makers. By changing the levels of taxation and government spending, the government can influence the level of aggregate demand, either stimulating it during recessions or contracting it during periods of inflation in order to promote the macroeconomic objectives of, let's outline what those objectives are down here, we've probably discussed these in earlier lessons, are full employment, meaning nearly everyone who wants a job has one, economic growth, meaning output is increasing over time, and price level stability, meaning inflation is low and stable. So of course, changing the level of aggregate demand through fiscal policies can help raise or lower the inflation rate, as we're about to see. So let's go over to our graph and we'll look at a situation in which a country might be interested in implementing expansionary fiscal policies. Notice that this economy is currently producing at Y1, which is at an equilibrium below full employment. You now know this is called a recessionary gap. Its price level of PL1 is lower than the full employment price level, which I'll call PLFE. This country has deflation or perhaps disinflation not good. There are many reasons that deflation is bad for a nation's economy. This country most likely would want to stimulate aggregate demand to try to get output closer to or back to the full employment level. To do so, the government could use what's called expansionary fiscal policy. In order to increase aggregate demand, a government can either decrease the tax rate in the economy or the level of taxation or increase government spending. These two changes to taxation or government spending are the two types of expansionary fiscal policy. Let's walk through how each of these would affect the level of aggregate demand in the economy and help restore full employment in this country. Let's start with a tax cut. What is the mechanism by which a decrease in taxation would help restore full employment in a country? Well, what are taxes? This is the money that government takes out of individuals and businesses, revenues, or incomes. Therefore, a reduction in taxes on businesses and households would increase disposable incomes. The level of disposable income, you may recall, is a determinant of consumption and business investment. If firms enjoy more profits because they're paying fewer taxes, firms are more likely to invest in capital equipment and technology. So lower taxes lead to higher disposable incomes, which leads to increased consumption and increased investment, both of which are components of aggregate demand. So we should expect to see reduced taxes lead to an increase in aggregate demand, which as we'll see in the graph in just a moment, should lead to an increase in national income and an increase in the price level. This 
is the mechanism by which expansionary fiscal policy in the form of tax cuts should help restore full employment in a country. Let's walk through how government spending can lead to an increase in aggregate output and the price level. This one's gonna be more straightforward, of course, because government spending is a direct component of aggregate demand. So an increase in government spending, we don't have to go through this whole disposable income step here. An increase in government spending directly injects money into the circular flow and causes an increase in aggregate demand, which in turn leads to an increase in national output and an increase in the price level, or you could say a higher inflation rate. Moving over to our graph, we can illustrate the effect of these expansionary fiscal policies. In both cases, lower taxes or increased government spending are going to stimulate aggregate demand in this economy, shifting the AD curve outward and to the right and helping the economy achieve the full employment level of output. We should see higher inflation as the price level increases and we should see a recovery as output returns to full employment. Now, if you watched the last video in this unit, you saw that there's actually a multiplier effect that would take place in either of these scenarios, a tax cut or an increase of government spending. And that's what I wanna talk about in the last part of this video. How does a change in taxes affect aggregate demand relative to a change in government spending? To illustrate this, let's assume that the needed change in GDP is $100, very simple. Keep it very simple here, $100. Of course, in a real economy, that might be $100 billion or $1 billion, some much larger number, but we're just gonna keep the number simple. So let's assume that the needed increase in GDP is $100. And let's also assume that the MPC, the marginal propensity to consume, is 0 0.5. This gives us a multiplier of one over one minus 0 0.5, which is one over 0 0.5, which comes out to, very simple calculation there, two. This country has a spending multiplier, that's what the K stands for, of two. We can quickly calculate the needed change in government spending necessary to achieve the $100 increase in total GDP. So the needed change in G is the needed change in GDP, that's 100, divided by two, which is $50. So an increase in government spending of $50, change colors here, if government spending increases by $50, this would lead to an increase in GDP of $100. The question though is how much of a tax cut would be needed to achieve the same increase in GDP? And the answer is something larger than $50. Allow me to explain and illustrate why. A tax cut is an indirect injection into a nation's circular flow. So let's take that in our notes down here. Tax cuts are an indirect injection into the circular flow. Let's assume the government lowers taxes by $50. Taxes are not a component of aggregate demand. Consumption and investment are components of aggregate demand. So a tax cut of $50 will increase disposable income among households by $50. Now, households are going to spend 50% of that. So there will only be an initial increase in aggregate expenditures of 50 times 0 0.5, which is our marginal propensity to consume. Remember, our MPC was 0 0.5. So that $50 of new disposable income will only translate to $25 of new spending in the economy. Now I can take that $25 of new spending and multiply it by the multiplier of two, which gives us a $50 increase in GDP. Notice that we're $50 short. A $50 tax cut did not achieve the same increase in total output as a $50 increase in government spending because the tax cut is indirect. Consumption will only increase by half of that or whatever proportion is determined by the marginal propensity to consume. So that leads us to a very important question. How do we find the tax multiplier? How do we determine 
the amount of a tax cut that would be necessary to achieve a particular increase in GDP? And the answer is there's a different formula for the tax multiplier. The tax multiplier is always going to be smaller than the spending multiplier. And the formula we use is negative MPC over MPS. And let's see what that gives us. So this country's marginal propensity to consume was 0.5. That's negative 0.5. And its marginal propensity to save was 0.5. So we do negative 0.5 or 0.5 gives us a tax multiplier of negative 1. Now this is negative because whatever direction taxes are changed in, GDP is going to change in the opposite direction. So if I scroll down a little bit more, we're going to find out how much of a tax cut is needed in order to achieve a $100. This is what we want, a $100 increase in GDP. And the solution here is to divide the needed change in GDP by the tax multiplier. And that gives us a tax cut of 100 divided by negative 1, which is negative $100. In other words, we need a negative $100 change in taxes or a tax cut. All right, so here's what we have found. The tax multiplier in this scenario, the tax multiplier is smaller than the spending multiplier. The implication for fiscal policy makers is as follows. A tax cut will always need to be larger than an increase in government spending to achieve a particular change in GDP. It's a very important point that's going to come up later on when we evaluate fiscal policy. Whether a country chooses to increase government spending on things like infrastructure or cut taxes, they're both going to have an effect on the government's budget and can both lead to increased national debt. However, an increase in government spending is always going to give fiscal policymakers more bang for their buck than a tax cut of the same amount. This is because government spending is a direct component in the nation's economy, whereas taxes are indirect. So we've learned that the tax multiplier is always smaller than the spending multiplier. The formula for the tax multiplier, which you may or may not need to know for your particular class, is negative MPC over MPS. You divide the marginal propensity to consume by the marginal propensity to save, and the result will give you the value by which a change in taxes will be multiplied in order to determine the ultimate effect on aggregate demand and aggregate output in a country. So in this video, we defined fiscal policy. We talked about how fiscal policy can be used to help an economy recover from a demand-efficient recession. Tax cuts, increases in government spending, they're both going to boost aggregate demand and lead to a greater level of output and a higher price level. Here we go. One step at a time, don't believe.